Hey everybody, Melon here. Welcome back to another episode of Teardown. Today we're going to be tearing down the Razer Viper V3 Pro. Now the Viper V3 Pro, as I talked about in my full review, is actually a pretty impressive mouse. Definitely one of the better mice you can get on the market, but the gap between Razer and the rest of the market isn't as big as it was when this mouse first released, which definitely doesn't make it as good as it was supposed to be a couple years ago, but the mouse is still pretty impressive. But there are some very unique aspects to this mouse, as many of the parts inside this mouse are not user server. So while the mouse is overall relatively impressive, repairability is definitely a bit of a concern here. So today I wanted to make a video and outline these repairability concerns as well as talk about the modding potential for this mouse and go over the individual components and the board specs and much more. But as always, before we do any kind of teardown video, you'll need a couple things. Firstly, you'll need some kind of soldering mat or some kind of rubber mat to do your teardown. Now you can also just use a cloth and you can use something like an ice cube tray to keep track of your screws, but a soldering mat is the easiest overall experience as you can keep track of all your screws on this mat. And you'll also need a precision set of screwdriver, but just as we saw with the previous Razer mice, you will need a special bit to open the Viper V3 Pro as the four base screws are Torx bits. So you will need a Torx screwdriver to get the mouse open. But on the plus side, once you're inside, the rest of the screws are just standard Phillips head, so it's much easier to work on. But once you have all that, you're ready to go ahead and get started with your teardown. But before we dive in, a big thank you again to Razer for sending over the Viper V3 Pro for review. I greatly appreciate it. And thank you to all of our channel members who make videos like this possible. If you'd like to support my efforts here with the in-depth reviews and of course the teardown project, consider becoming a member here on the channel as that gives you early access to all upcoming content and supports what I do here on the channel. But without further ado, let's get right into today's episode of Teardown. All right, now to start off, in order to open up the unit, you will need to remove the stock skates on the mouse, which is a little difficult as there is no skate removal ramps. So I'd recommend taking a pry tool like this or a flathead screwdriver and gently putting it in on the edges of the skates and peeling them up from there. But unfortunately, the stock skates are single use, so taking them off will most likely damage them. So make sure you have some kind of aftermarket skates to replace them when you're done your teardown. And with the stock skates removed, we can go ahead and access the base removal screws here and we can grab our Torx bit and we can go ahead and remove these. All right, and then with all the base screws removed, go ahead and make a pincer with your hands like this and grab the mouse at the widest part of this rear curvature here and put a little pressure onto the sides of the shell and with enough pressure, the back will pop open like that. And then you can take a pry tool or a fingernail and run it along the sides of the shell. Now with the top and base shell disconnected, a very important step here is you don't want to pull the shells up and out. You want to gently slip this one up and pull it backwards and out. As you can see here, this antenna that is built onto the main board does stick out from the shell and does kind of hover in this top area here. And if you pull the shells out at a weird angle, you could break this, so be very mindful of that. And also on the inside, we do also have a ribbon cable, very similar in style to the connector that Vax uses on their mice, which you can disconnect by grabbing the base of the cable and gently very gently wiggling it out from the top, just like that. And with that, that is how you disconnect the top and base shells here. I'm gonna go ahead and put the top shell off to the side. We can focus on the base next. All right, now for the base shell here, it's a pretty standard layout as expected for a main board here. We do have a bit of a unique connector for the battery as it's actually the underside of the board, which is quite unique. I haven't seen that yet in my, all my teardowns I've done before, but it is what it is. Now to remove the main board, we're gonna go ahead and swap out to a standard Phillips heads. We're gonna get rid of our Torx bit and we're going to remove four anchoring screws here on the main board. There is one here, 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 and here. All right, and then with those screws removed, we can grab the main board and just gently lift it up off of its standoffs and out from the front of the shell, just like that. And then we can flip it over towards the base here, and we can disconnect this JST plug here on the battery by grabbing from the sides and just gently wiggling out. And that is how you disconnect the main board from the battery. This is actually a really cool design for the board because this is a very lightweight and a very small board. I think this is one of the smallest PCBs I've seen on a like standard mouse or like a big brand mouse to date. So very impressive engineering from Razer here in that aspect. And then lastly, we do have the 306 milliamp hour battery here. Now you can remove this little piece of foam here as it's there for, I believe, balancing if I'm not mistaken. You can just gently peel this off. 
and you can remove the battery, but as you can see, it's kind of in its own little housing here. So you'd have to get in a pry tool and push from the back here. Now, because I want my mouse to be operational afterwards, I'm not gonna do this because there's a pretty good chance I'm gonna damage the battery. But if you wanna replace the battery, you can just get a battery of the same size and voltage and make sure it still has this smaller uh, tri-pin JSD connector and you should be able to replace that as well. And one other really cool attention to details, as you can see here, the actual contact here for the base button here that controls the power and the DPI setting is melted down just like the main clicks and the side clicks. So if you flip this over, the button isn't gonna follow, which is actually a very nice little attention to detail. As I'm sure you've seen multiple times in other teardown videos here on the channel, these buttons falling out is a nightmare to deal with, so that is a nice thing to see. But with that, that's everything for the base shell here for the Viper V3 Pro, so I'll put this off to the side, and now we can focus on the top shell. All right, now the top shell is where this gets interesting as the Viper V3 Pro is using a very unique internal design for the top shell here. Now this may look kind of similar to what Logitech or Vaxi does where they have this central cage-like structure, but this is a more simple take on that design concept, which does make it a little easier to service than the aforementioned mice. Now to start off, what we're gonna do here is we're going to remove the four anchoring screws here for the top shell. So there is one right here, 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 and here. Now with those removed, we can gently shimmy this out of the base here, but you see this tiny little piece of plastic towards the top here, that actually holds this in place because it angles it inward. So it's kind of hard to take out and you kind of have to shimmy it out a little uniquely. And what I recommend doing is grabbing from the back here and just gently pushing up here and you can see how these two little standoffs towards the front are kind of gently moving up. Once it gets to about this point, take your screwdriver and gently push it in from the front here and pull up on both sides until it's almost released. And then once they're almost both at the top, just pop it off and pop it off just like that. And the top shell cage part will come out just in one solid piece. Now I'm not exactly sure what the point of this is. My initial assumption is this is maybe just for stabilization to prevent this from rocking. But again, there are a lot of screws anchoring in this top part here. So maybe it's just a conduit for the LED. I'm not exactly sure why it's designed this way. So it does make taking out this top shell cage structure a little difficult, but it is what it is. Now I'm gonna put this cage-like structure off to the side because I wanna talk about this top piece here. Now, as I talked about in before review, the main end side buttons are actually melted down. So as you can see here, their contacts are melted down. So you can't actually take these out of the shell. Now, I don't even know why there's an anchoring screw in here because removing it doesn't do anything. Maybe it's just for tensioning, but again, everything's melted down. So you can't remove or use or replace either of the main buttons or the side buttons, as you can see, as their contacts are also melted down, just as the base DPI and power buttons contact was done as well. Now, this is kind of one of those 50-50 things, as I talked about in my full review, where on one side, this is very bad in terms of user serviceability as if you damage a main click or a side button you can't replace it yourself which means you have to replace the entire top shell and yes while the top shell and the base shell is made out of biodegradable plastic it would have been nice to see this be user serviceable but on the other side this is a benefit and also some other ways because having these contact points melted down means that these main clicks are never going to kind of destabilize themselves over long-term use which can happen to mice that are just using these standard anchoring methods now do i like this from a repairability standpoint absolutely not. I would much rather see Razer do kind of what Vaxi did where they have two anchoring screws and a very thick standoff so they don't fall off. That is a much more preferable methodology of doing this but again Razer being such a big brand in terms of just dealing with customer issues after the fact having these melted down does make sense for a bigger brand like this. So the top shell is just one solid piece so we can't really do too much to this. We'll put that back off to the side. All right now next up for the top shell we have this central cage like structure here. Now weirdly enough I was under the impression that this was going to be serviceable as previous teardowns I've seen to this mouse, you were able to remove both the side button PCB and the main click and scroll PCB. But the ones here on my unit appears to be glued down as you can kind of see like remnants of a little bit of adhesive poking out from the corners here and here. And there's a little bit poking out from here. So I'm not exactly sure why that was changed. I'm assuming maybe there was an issue with these components coming loose over time, so Razer just decided to glue them down or secure them. But regardless, unfortunately on my unit, I can't remove these as I tried to remove the side button, I almost broke this piece here. And I tried to do this here, and this is an extremely thin PCB, which means it's gonna be very easy to damage that as well. So I'm not gonna remove this from my teardown just because it appears to be glued down. Now, maybe this is just my unit, maybe on other units this isn't an issue. So again, it'll probably more depend on batch and whether this is gonna be glued down 
kind of secured, but regardless. But if you do want to remove this, you can just unclip this little clip here under these two screws, take this cable out. You can pop this PCB off of its little plastic standoffs here, and then you can also pop this off of its standoffs as well pretty easily. But aside from the non-serviceable nature like the rest of the top shell here, one cool aspect I did miss about this is that these switches appear to be hot swappable. As you can see, I can actually pull this switch out pretty far. Uh, I actually noticed this unintentionally as this one doesn't come out at all, so it may just be a bad uh, clip on this switch. You can see that there's clips on the sides here, so it looks like this switch can actually be swapped out. Now, since it's a proprietary razor or ratio switch, I'm not really sure what other switch types would be compatible with it, but at least that does make it easy to repair a switch if it does break. Again, it's kind of hard to get out because the pin is kind of in a weird spot because they're towards the top here, so I can't really take that off, but that is a nice little attention to detail to make the top semi-serviceable. But again, oddly enough, it appears that my main click PCB and screw wheel PCB and my side button PCB have been glued down. So there's no getting those off here, which is unfortunate from a repairability standpoint. But at this point, the entire top shell of Viper V3 Pro is basically a write-off because you can basically do nothing here aside from replace the main click switches, which is quite disappointing, but it is what it is. And this is the kind of thing I expected to see from one of the bigger brands. But now that the top shell is all disassembled, let's go ahead and talk about the individual component specs here for the Viper V3 Pro. All right, now in terms of PCB layout and specs, first off, as I mentioned earlier, we have the 306 milliamp hour battery here, which is a bit of an odd capacity, but it does give the Viper V3 Pro very good battery life, which is great to see. Next on the main board here, we have the Razer Focus Pro Gen 2 sensor, which is most likely a variant of a Pixar 3970 SKU. And we have a Nordic 52840 MCU, which was covered with a sticker funnily enough, um, but it is just a standard MCU of choice for most gaming mice on the market. And lastly, for the top shell here, we have the Chen Fang side buttons I talked about my full review. We have the proprietary Razer or Ratio Gen 3 switches. And then we have a TDC white core dustproof eight millimeter encoder here for the scroll wheel. And the scroll wheel switch is a variation of the Chen Fang side buttons, just optimized with a larger surface contact point, as you can see under the wheel there, which makes it much more consistent and much better for scroll wheel use, which is a great thing to see as the pillar switches we commonly see many brands use are pretty lackluster in terms of their feeling. But now that we've talked about individual component specs, let's go ahead and talk about weight. All right, now in terms of weight, as a reminder, the Viper V3 Pro is being advertised as weighing around 55 grams for the white version and 54 grams for the black version, where my unit in reality weighed around 55.3 grams. So I'm going to assume that 0.3 gram ratio also applies to the black and the Sentinels and the Faker editions. But regardless, the white edition is gonna be around 55.3 grams. Now in terms of individual component weights, first we have the top shell with the main click and side button still installed and the anchoring screw since taking them out serves no purpose which collectively weighs 23 grams on the dot. Next, we have the central cage-like structure with the side button PCB and the main click PCB still installed as you can't remove them, and this collectively weighs 9.2 grams. We have the base shell with the 306 milliamp hour battery still installed as well as the base control button, which collectively weighs around 13 grams. Then we have the main PCB, which weighs 6.1 grams. And lastly, all the screws that I can remove from the Viper V3 Pro collectively weighs 0.9 grams. All right, now that we've talked about component weights and specs, let's go ahead and start our reassembly process, which is gonna be pretty quick as there wasn't really a lot to disassemble per se here on this mouse. But firstly, we're gonna start off with the top shell. Now the top shell is going to be pretty easy to reassemble. However, just as a note, if you did take this out, make sure you push the main clicks down to make sure they are fully anchored just in case it did pop out like mine did. Now to reinstall this, what you wanna do is you wanna take these two holes towards the top and you wanna put them onto those standoffs towards the front here, but you have to put it in at an angle due to this little threader here. So you kind of have to put it in like this so much and then you have to press it in onto the standoffs. Now this can be a little finicky because you do have to bend this quite a bit but you should be able to get it into place like that and then once it's in place just take your thumb and just gently press it down and just make sure this is all fully down there's no give to it and you can check this by seeing if the side pieces have actually met with their stabilizers on the side shell which they have and then with this installed we can go ahead and anchor it into the top shell by installing the anchoring screw that goes here 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 and here. All right, and then with that reinstalled, that is everything for the top shell here. But before you go forward, just verify that your main click, side buttons, and scroll wheel still work. So verify everything works. If your main clicks feel a little stiff, it might just be because this isn't sitting properly. So take it out, re-anchor it, and make sure everything's anchored properly, and then that should be good to go. But once you've verified the top shell is all functional, we can go ahead and put that off to the side, and we can start with the base shell reassembly next. 
Alrighty, and this, just like the top shell, is going to be pretty straightforward. The trickiest part about this is going to be re-anchoring the battery, which we can do by just holding the board like this and taking this JST connector here for the battery and just plug it into the bottom just like that and just quickly squeeze it into place with your fingers just like that. And then you can just take the main board and drop it into place on the top shell here, which is pretty straightforward. Now you may need to kind of angle it in towards the front here, but you should be able to just have it sit flat right away. It's like that. Now sometimes the standoffs won't go down all the way, which is why you saw me click it down, but just make sure it sits flat like this. And then flip it over and just verify that your base button still functions which it does. And then once that's done, we can go ahead and re-anchor the anchoring screws, which go here, 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 and here. All right, now with that done, just because the base is a little thin and it can warp pretty easily, just verify that your base sits completely flat on a tabletop. Make sure there's no wobbling to it. If your base does wobble, untension these screws and retension them and make sure only to screw them in until you feel a little bit of feedback as if you over tension them, it could cause the base to warp a little bit. But that is everything for the base shell reassembly as I expected, pretty straightforward. And then we can go ahead and reassemble the top of the base shell. Now this is probably gonna be the hardest part of this entire teardown, at least the way we did it, as all we have to do is get this ribbon cable back into this connector here. Now thankfully Razor made it quite long, so it is pretty easy to work with, which makes this a little easier than I expected. So you can take the shells, put them back together kind of like this, and then with enough pressure you can move it into its connector just like that. Now one thing to verify before you close the mouse up is that you want to make sure this is sitting flat, which can be kind of difficult. You can kind of push this part down to show the top like that, and you want to make sure it's sitting flat. I'm just going to give mine a little bit of a push there. Now if it's on an angle, it might not make proper contact, which could cause connectivity issues. So if your mouse is having weird issues after you disassemble it, reseed this cable as this is likely the issue. Now once everything is together, I just put the shells roughly together like this, turn the mouse on, and go ahead and check that your side clicks, your main buttons, and your scroll wheel and the sensor all work. Again, if you notice any issues, just reseed this cable. And then once you've verified everything is good to go, just go ahead, turn your mouse back off. And then we can go ahead and anchor the top shells in. Now, again, you have to be mindful of the antenna. So you want to put it into the top shell like this. You just basically want to make it sit flat just like that. And then once it's roughly in place, run your fingers along the side of the shell. Just do it again, just to make sure everything made proper contact. And then we can go ahead and swap back to our Torx bit and re-anchor the four anchoring screws on the base of the mouse. And then once those are installed, go ahead and just double check your mouse is sitting completely flat on a flat surface. And then once that's all done, you've verified everything is functional, go ahead and reinstall your preferred set of aftermarket skates and that is everything for your teardown. So overall, I will say this mouse is a little disappointing when it comes to the repairability aspect. Again, there were a lot of other components to the Viper V3 Pro I personally did find a little disappointing compared to aftermarket options. Sure, again, this mouse does have the best available specs on the market, but again, the gap between the Viper V3 Pro and the rest of the market has closed a lot since it was released in April 2024, but we'll have to see if the V4 versions of these mice, which should be releasing at some point in the near future, I'm assuming given their previous release cycle, we'll see if they can kind of increase that gap again. But on those mice, I would love to see them be a little more serviceable and moddable as there really isn't a lot you can do inside this mouse, which is quite disappointing, but it does give me some concerns in terms of long-term durability as sure the mouse does have a two-year warranty, but if you have an issue outside of that two-year warranty or something that isn't covered by the warranty, you're pretty much AWOL as you can't really replace a lot of the components inside this mouse, which is very disappointing. So while the Viper V3 Pro is serviceable, again, it's not as serviceable as many aftermarket options, which does make it kind of hard for me to recommend aside from all the other aspects to this mouse. But with that, that's everything for today's episode of Teardown. Thank you again to Razor for sending over the Viper V3 Pro for review. And if you did miss my full review, I have an hour long review of this mouse over on my channel. So go check that out if you haven't seen that already. And if you enjoy the Teardown and want to see more videos like this, consider leaving a like on this video and get subscribed to the channel. And of course, a big thank you to all of our channel members who make videos like this possible. And if you would like to support what I do here on the channel with the hour long reviews, and of course, tear down videos like this one, consider becoming a channel member as that is not only the best way to directly support my efforts here on the channel, you also get early access to all upcoming content like this one. So if you wanna see new episodes of tear down or the melon review before anyone else, consider becoming a channel member today. But that's everything for today. Thank you very much for watching. and I'll catch you all in the next episode of tear down. Peace.